pictures. All right. So, um, so again, hopefully you had a great weekend and all that. And this week we have a full, full slate out there. And I did send out kind of like a preview of, of the week and a post. So bear in mind with that, we will stick with our case study on Mao and we'll, we'll, we'll put some closure to him on Friday with uh, an assessment related to Mao. So bear, uh, just keep that in the back of your mind as well. Okay. So with that, um, in Schoology, so you'll see in Schoology, something like this, there um, uh, with with you at home as well. Uh, this uh, Mao Zedong in review, and there's a little padlet, and so open that up. That'd be great. I'll we'll also put it in uh, the chat, so those at home can just click on that as well. Yeah. So in the pilot will look something like this. And all I'm asking you to do here is going back, looking at our focus questions or uh, that placard activity on Friday and what you know, um, just jot down, it'd be great, list one factor that has contributed to Mao's rise to power. And again, duplications is okay. All right. Um, and list one way Mao consolidated his power. So, you know, if we look at the focus questions are dealing more with rise and that creation of PRC is more about this consolidation. All right, so hopefully you found it. All right, just go at it and we'll take about five, 10 minutes here. So let's please, there we go. Let's populate that thing.
All right. So just finish up your thought there. Long march out. All right, put your finishing touches there. It'd be fantastic if you can. Be awesome. Okay. So I kind of spelled gorilla with a gorilla. All right, so I'm looking at this list here. A lot of really good good stuff here intermixed in there. The um, ways that he rose to power, but then also consolidating his power. Um, good reference to the Long March. Of course, peasants are a big piece there as well. Army, uh, tactics. Um, definitely uh, we'll look at manipulation, a part of it, tricking. A lot of stuff here. So over the past two class periods, we've got a lot of good stuff here. Control people through thought control. A um, little cult of personality in there as well. Um, rescue movements here. A lot of movements are part of it. Taking advantage of some situations, different movements and campaigns, all that stuff. So, yes. So if we look back onto it, his rise to power. Definitely you can say uh, peasants that is a very big part of it. That's his base. Um, his military, of course, the guerrilla tactics is going to be a big part of the first phase. And that second phase, uh, you know, the transition to more of a people's liberation army and more conventional army is a part of that as well. Personal characteristics. Mao himself can also um, play a big part too. The leadership that he has, um, the confidence, the determination. The guy had an idea like what he uh, wanted for China. It's just going to take some time to get that there. Of course, taking advantage of uh, opportunities. Uh, the Sino-Japanese War is an opportunity here. Mistakes by his opponents, obviously, as a part of it too. The that group of Moscow trained communists, those were the Bolshevik 28. So all that is contributing to his rise. But then once he is there, uh, you know, one thing that we know about Mao is he's his place at the head of the Communist Party of China is always a little tenuous. It he he definitely is is a big uh, personality and figure to deal with. But there are times that he is there in the front, but then he also is taking steps back as well. It is during that first decade after that revolution or after that civil war, I should say, is he's really consolidating the power through all those different campaigns uh, and um, self-criticizing uh, uh, sessions that people need to go through. Um, and looking at the different movements and all that is about him consolidating, and of course, policies. 
certain types of policies dealing with agriculture, dealing with the industrial sectors, all that stuff is a part of his consolidating of power. So a lot of good stuff here that's in there. And, and naturally, yeah, manipulation, fear, and control, those are always good words as well to throw in there. All that plays a part in any single party state, whether it's a fascist or communist left or right leaning uh, regime. Uh, definitely those all play a factor. All right. Um, anyone else have any thoughts about that? A lot of good, a lot of good, a lot of good points uh, being brought up here. So I appreciate that. All right. We've got a little video clip here. I want to watch a little video clip and there might be some National Geographic moments in there uh, with this clip. And what I, what I think this clip does is a really good job is highlighting um, Mao, his vision, and then the reality of it being implemented. And so I want you to look at um, his methods or the methods of implementing some of these policies, but then also the impact of it. And early on, early on, uh, Mao kind of finds uh, that he even has some limits here. It's going to be called, this clip is called The Great Leap. It is a playoff of his, one of his early economic policies known as uh, The Great Leap uh, Forward. And we can, we can uh, definitely critique that afterwards. All right, so let's take a look at that as we watch this. This will be about a 14-minute minute clip here. And then afterwards, let's see if we can get some feedback here. And so at home, also, feel free to put into the chat. Um, any reactions that you that you have to this little video clip here? All right. The same effort to get mass participation was applied to another type of cleansing of incorrect thoughts. People were asked to look out for neighbors or fellow workers who seemed to meet the party's description of rightists or capitalist roaders or counter-revolutionaries and who were denounced. But the boldest attempt to harness the energy and enthusiasm of the people... Sorry, I gotta stop for one moment here. Um, the suggestion boxes, you know, and the thought was, you know, turn, turn on your neighbor. Uh, and uh, if they have capitalist inroaders thoughts or if they're considered rightists. All right, this is, this is happening in the 1950s and in China. But that's, so, that's not necessarily out of the sort. What's happening in the United States in the 1950s? The Red Scare. And we're asking Americans uh, to kind of turn on Americans if they're not loyal enough, you know. We want to point out your neighbors are communists and, and, and turn them in. So um, 1950s in general, if we look across the world, um, we are at extreme ways of, of thinking here and, and looking for things that might be challenging systems and, and ways of life. So I always find that, you know, uh, putting things into historical context of, of that sort. Um, China will definitely have more victims to this type of tactics than we'll find in, in some Western countries like the United States. All right, I'll stop. I'll go back at it. Came in 1958. To speed up progress, Mao wanted to use the force he believed in most, China's sheer numbers, for his great leap forward. Propaganda cartoons showed how the Chinese were meant to overtake Western industry and food production. Peasants already reorganized into cooperatives were herded into huge communes. In his area, District Secretary Zhu Guodun took on another challenge. <laughs> I was responsible for setting up people's communes and turned eight agricultural cooperatives into two big communes. There were over 100,000 people in each one.
Big communes could handle big projects. With thousands of people to do a job, things were completed in no time. Production brigades were directed to where they were thought to be needed most, under militia-like discipline. The party said it was a more efficient, better, faster way to build socialism. Private land had already gone. Now family life was to be destroyed as well. Peasants were to eat food cooked in central kitchens. Children would be looked after together. Mao set the target of doubling food production in one year. Revolutionary enthusiasm, he said, will triumph over all obstacles. He took a close interest as the peasants competed to increase yields. When the Dongshun commune promised a record harvest, it was Zhong Guodong, the district secretary, who showed the chairman round. Chairman Mao himself visited the show field and asked how much it was expected to yield. My colleague said 50,000 pounds an acre. Chairman Mao replied to him, even if you could achieve 10% of that, it would be a miracle. The party encouraged the rivalry. In the past, wheat yields had been 500 pounds an acre. Hu 三观措施加了马,我们措施带火箭 In fact, the records were bogus. Communes falsified their figures. We removed all the ready planted rice from the fields and planted it in a show field so that we could reach our quota. Planting it so densely with no light or wind blowing through meant it rot. For long the rice did rot and the peasants got angry. They said, if you take all the rice and waste it, what will we eat in the autumn? The peasants didn't want to go on with this cheating. I tried to get it stopped, but the municipal boss ordered us to carry on. But the full statistics contributed to a dangerous delusion that China had plenty of food and could concentrate on other things. We must reach for the moon and the stars, said Mao. Man can achieve anything he can imagine. Great construction projects also pulled mass numbers against the apparently insuperable obstacles. Lin County in Henan was an arid plain blocked off by mountains. The 3,000 kilometers long Red Flag Canal was planned to bring in water over the rocky terrain. The canal workers were celebrated as revolutionary heroes. Chung worked on the rock face. 
I tie a rope on my body, swing out in the air. I used a pick to remove the loose stones. When they fell, I had to try hard to keep out of the way and avoid getting my legs broken. Accidents were frequent. Zhen Yang Chung was sent to clear up afterwards. When you were at the foot of the mountain and looked up, you could see bits of flesh glinting in the sun. I climbed down the rope. I picked up some dirt to wipe away every trace of the bodies. Otherwise people would have been too frightened to carry on. But the canal took twice as many people and far longer to build than expected. Initially, there were 30,000 on the project. The plan was that if each person built one meter, the canal would be completed in one or two months. But it was all much more difficult, because the canal was halfway up a mountain. In the end, it took ten years to complete. Leap Forward's most ambitious goal, Chinese were told production of steel also had to double in one year. And instead of producing this just from heavy industry, the energy and goodwill of the peasants was to be mobilized again. Small furnaces were built in villages and backyards across the country. They collected any scrap they could find. Next, they melted down doorknobs, wash basins, tools. As the fever grew, people even gave up their cooking walks. He Xinhua had never made steel before, but used her ingenuity. When we built our own furnaces, it was hard to reinforce them. Earth on its own wasn't strong, but we didn't have enough straw. I had a long pigtail, so I cut it off and snipped it into short pieces and mixed it with the earth in the furnace wall. Many of the other women cut off their hair as well. He Qinhua's husband, Yen Chan Yun, also found at the time, was just as keen. The two of us competed really hard. If my team produced three tons of steel a shift, her team would make over three tons. And then I would encourage my team to think of ways to beat that. Forests were decimated to fuel furnaces 24 hours a day. Over China, almost everyone, even hospital doctors, neglected their normal jobs to answer the call. But even those taking part began to see it was folly. All we did was make steel and nothing else. We didn't produce anything useful. How could we? We dug holes in the ground and tried to produce steel. It was all such a waste of time. But the orders came from above. We had to obey them. Slowly it became clear that after so much effort and time, after so much wood had been burnt and so many pots consigned to the flames, the steel produced was impure, weak and useless. The full effect of the disastrous experiment began to be seen in 1959. 
while the peasants had been making steel, they had done little else. Crops had rotted in the fields. Seed hadn't been planted. Food was already short. Because of the falsely exaggerated harvest, the government had taken a bigger share of the crops to send to the cities. A drought made the problem worse. In 1960, the scarcity turned into a major famine. National food production fell over a quarter. Local secretary Luo Shifa had been away from his village studying at a party school. When I came back from Beijing, I saw that many people had bloated stomachs from starvation. We had 1,600 starving people in our commune. Some were falling over with weakness and just lying in the road. Others died. When the peasants saw me, they began to cry. I cried too. They said to me, if I got there any later, they might all have been dead. In a secret report, the party later admitted the full extent of the calamity. Their own figures showed that over 20 million had died from the famine. It was almost certain more. The new graves of the burial grounds confirmed that the Great Leap had failed. Revolutionary enthusiasm hadn't been enough. In the aftermath, Mao kept to the side and let President Liu Shaqi run the country. Even Mao knew that the economy had to be protected from his revolutionary zeal for the time being. So more cautious targets were set. Large communes were abandoned. Chinese peasants were allowed some land again and could sell their produce in free markets. They were allowed to live as families and return to something near normal life. There were fewer slogans. So in the end, it looks like um, Mao's revolutionary zeal needs to take a back seat. And uh, those individuals, uh, Lu Chaoqi and um, Deng Xiaoping, who are going to be accused at times of being rightists, um, or even capitalist inroaders, are going to step forward and resurrect the, the economy. And, um, and Mao takes a step backwards. So looking at that little clip here, um, the great leap forward, if you look at it, methods, what methods was Mao and, and, and the communist leadership using trying to get China really accelerated, moving forward, as it says, the great leap? What kind of methods? What do you got? Okay. Setting quotas, you know, that's part of a pan economy uh, is set quotas and they were competing <laughs> Whether they're realistic or not, but they were competing. They got caught up. All right, good. What else? What else if we can look at methods either here or at home put in the chat at home Another method Let's see if we can find another one What do you got? Really hard on the steel and ended up being like they sacrificed things into it. Oh, okay. It's an interesting comment about you know people just getting it involved in making the steel, but in reality, the steel wasn't good. Um, but let's talk about that. You know, why did they why did they get involved so much? When people stop what they did, they got involved. Why? What what was what was their motive? Okay. 
um, create a better China, become better than some of those Western nations. Absolutely, that's part of it. Um, is there anything else that could be part of it? Who wants it to happen? Mao. Mao wants it to happen. And what, what do people think of Mao? He's God, man. He's all that in a bag of chips. Absolutely. Um, and if Mao's going to say it, they're going to do it. And they're singing their songs. They're going to come in mass, and they're doing it. And you can see that China is lacking a lot of modern equipment, too. They are lacking a lot of modern equipment. And, and some of it has to do with um, that, that they're isolated and just not get access to it or could be that hey we're going to do it on our own we're going to rely on the base which is the peasants uh to do it but mao says it if mao says it they got to do it and uh they'll keep going back to that they'll keep using mao because they know the brand and they know that uh the influence that mao is going to have here um, and eventually they'll put all his thoughts in a little red book. That's going to become very, very uh, important here. All right. So if we look at methods, it's, it's uh, using the people. It is Mao himself uh, part of that process. Um, but when we look at uh, the impact, what's the impact of this? What kind of impact can we look at the Great Leap Forward? Does it bring China forward? It was. It was a big failure, and that was a tough one. It was a tough one for Mao to acknowledge it was a failure. But it was a big failure, you know, and the quality of steel, that. What happened to the food production? It went down. It went down. And it had a famine, 20 million plus. So that's not definitely greatly for is not necessarily a success here by any means. Uh, and so it is the rightists that take control for the moment. Because uh, their thought is they're communists, but they want to avoid losing it all. So they're telling Mao, you got to take a step back, man. We'll fix things, and we'll go from there. Mao is plotting, though. Don't worry. Mao's going to come back. He is going to come back because um, his concern is um, people are going to get too comfortable with what is happening with China uh, under uh, the, the rightist control or the, the pragmatist control here. All right. Any other final thoughts here about that video clip? I think it does a, a de uh, gives us a nice little snapshot. How about them building that canal? Would you like to be on the rope? Ooh, no way. No way. I mean, what kind of safety harness did they have? It's just, it's, a, it's just a rope. It's better tie, better tie that knot correctly here. You have not. Oh, man. Um, and when they, when they, when they were doing that, building their canal, that kind of reminded of the similar methods being used in building the Transcontinental Railroad across the United States and uh, getting cutting through Rocky Mountains, um, tying people on ropes or putting them in little baskets, lowering them down, putting the putting the uh, the explosives in the little hole, and then hopefully either raising me up fast enough or I can get far enough away from the blast. Crazy, crazy, crazy stuff. All right. Um, I thought that was, that was very, and how ambitious they thought it was going to get done in a couple months and it took 10 years, 10 years. Modern day equipment might've cut it, hopefully it would cut it in half. All right. But 10 years, I think it was extraordinary that they could, put up the 35W bridge in less than a year. That's pretty extraordinary. I always, you know, hold my breath as I keep going across it, though, thinking, okay, it was put up in a year, but it's fine. 
it's fine. All right. So with that, what I have on the screen here is the, the Domestic and Foreign Policies Activity, something I talked briefly about on Friday. That's our spotlight for uh, the next several days is for you to really look at, analyze these domestic and foreign policies, just like you did with Hitler and Stalin. And again, it's, it's looking like this. And uh, there, I did attach some handouts to it, but you can also use uh, the chapter in the book related to Mao. Uh, for guidance as well. So you can use both those resources. You can work with a historical buddy as well if you need to. Just make sure everyone is uh, names up here and you're sharing it. I'm one of those uh, Google platforms that allow you to share it as well. Mao is a left-wing leader. He's communist, so that puts him on the left side. And we're looking at the region of Asia. So we moved out of Europe and we've gone into Asia now. And so if we were taking the IB exam, this would, this would set us up where you could compare two authoritarians from different regions, all right? So that's why we're looking at, at Mao now. And then uh, next week, we'll look at a different one, and that would be a choice. Now, I put down a few examples here, things that I thought might be a little bit harder to find or glean out of the material dealing with minorities and uh, the arts. And um, the, we could say today, People's Republic of China is still having issues with um, uh, different uh, minority groups. Uh, and especially when you look at the Uyghurs out there in the Western regions of, of China. And so this whole idea, they want to avoid um, little, um, uh, one could say regional nationalism or nationalism with different uh, groups outside of China. They want to have this mainstream, mainstream uh, culture. And, and so how they deal with minorities uh, might be totally different than with, um, with some of the other authoritarians are looking at. All right. So topics are all the same. Foreign policy. This is the Cold War era. It's not a slam dunk that Communist China is going to be BFFs with communist uh, Soviet Union. They have two different brands of communism. And so that's going to create some tension at times. And they're willing to lob some missiles at each other to highlight their differences. And uh, it'll take the United States a little while to figure out how to utilize that difference in the Cold War. But that's all part of that as well. All right. So what I'll do here is I will uh, cut you loose. Let's work on this uh, for the rest of the class period. And so I think we got, what, about a half hour here of the class period time to do this. Tomorrow will be very similar. I'll take some time uh, to look at another aspect of uh, Chinese society being recreated under Mao and then give you some time to work on this. All right. And so ultimately, this is going to be due Wednesday. So do we have any questions or concerns? All right. All right, so those at home, you can either stay on or exit and have a great day.